Uh, the show is brought to you by East West Rental, Cowell Enterprises, IT and E, and our friends at Jack in the Box. Jay, when are we going to do our milkshake morning? I think we should do that for Sabrina's first day back when she's physically back in the studio. Oh, and face to face. Yeah. yeah. Guys, Milkshakes for everybody. In case you didn't hear, Sabrina Salas Metanani is on island now in the quarantine facility. Milkshakes for breakfast is the thing to do. We're, we're going to make it a thing. Right. Milkshake, we'll get that trending. We should do like Milkshake Monday or something. You know, I, I wonder if, have the senators ever had like milkshakes in session? I don't think they. <laughs> There's probably something with the rules, right? Uh, Are you allowed to drink milkshakes on the session floor, uh, Madam Speaker? Many years ago, the uh, Don Parkinson, Speaker Don Parkinson, had an ice cream machine. I was just telling my staff about ah. this. And he, he had it, and they had a room next to the session where they would, ha you know, have food, drinks. And, right. and he brought in this commercial soft-serve ice cream machine. And he he was very picky about how it was mixed and made. And so I remember him, like, supervising that very closely. And, uh, of course, it was like a treat for everybody, but... It was really unusual because the machine's huge. I've never seen one before. Before that, that was years ago. And uh, <laughs> God. Yeah. was it? Better? No, I haven't. In this building, we really aren't uh, doing any food. Uh, you know, staff they do their own lunch, but otherwise, yeah, yeah, yeah. no, no ice cream on yeah. the session floor. Because the damn media, the media is too much on the scrutiny now. You guys cannot have a buffet without everyone getting all. Oh, how much did it cost? Like, <laughs> how was that ice cream though? Was it as good as Epen? It was good. Was I it? don't know about E-Pen, but E-Pen's is the best. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's interesting. A guy was it just... takes strolls for that. Yes. Right, yeah. I always wanted a soft serve ice cream machine in the house. Um, okay, let's get into official business now. So, Madam Speaker, I guess we just wanted to, first of all, as a health chair, get your reaction on this um, extension, delay, whatever you want to call it, uh, for the reopening of the island uh, due to the clusters. Of course, I know you know that they kind of put a two-week uh, pause on everything, including uh, the quarantine uh, modifications that were set to go into place if we reach the path to half. And it's it's a little funny to me, well, not funny, but that we reached the path to half, which was kind of like one of the finish lines that the governor put out. Uh, but then because of the clusters, that ended up being so anticlimactic. So just what are your, your thoughts on this uh, delay of two weeks? Well, um you know, I'm not going to question whether we should have gone into a delay, but I do know that this delay is causing huge um, impacts to people who are trying to plan, right? And so it really makes planning very difficult, planning your businesses, planning your personal travel. We've got lots of travel going on for graduations or things like that, taking people out to school and just business travel. And it's really, um, I know many people have put their travel off until our our quarantine requirements change and now that they're not changed it's it's really um setting things up so yeah that's difficult so you know i just hope that we can contain these clusters as soon as possible that we have a strategy going forward uh to to do it very quickly you know no matter what clusters or no matter what strains come in that we are going to be able to detect those quickly and stop them i asked the governor you know about uh, should we reconsider exemptions to quarantine? Mm. You know, is this uh, something that we should be concerned about? Is this how the variants are getting in and getting around? And uh, she was very adamant that, no, we should not uh, change our exemptions. These are uh, critical workers, and so they need to continue to be exempt. I'm just concerned that uh, they are, they're not just being exempt from the hotel quarantines and quarantine at home. They're, they're going to work, you know, every day. So, there is exposure. And I think we nobody can deny that. So yeah. that's just a concern. And we're just going to have to be very, I think businesses who have people who are critical workers who are being exempted from quarantine are going to have to look on their side and do something to protect uh, all the other workers when these, these critical workers, you know, come back. Right. There was you know, a just to create some kind of, uh, um, you know, limited contact so that, we can control it quicker in case. Yeah. And I mean, we've seen with the case of these two doctors coming from India, it also happened with the guard, the guard returning from uh, mm -hmm. their deployment to DC uh, because of all that stuff that went down in the Capitol. But they had come in, the doctors and the guard with their negative tests, but eventually uh, ended up 
popping positive for the virus. So, yeah, I mean, there's, they call it ROM, the restriction of movement. So when you get exempted from the quarantine as a, an essential worker, uh, not only do you get to uh, avoid going in the hotel, uh, they allow you to travel to and from work and also conduct yes. any other essential business, which would include going to the grocery store, for example. Yes. So it's not just going to and from work. There's a lot of wiggle room. Um, mm. And, you know, human nature, you give an inch, take a mile. Oh, if I can go to the grocery store, well, why can't I go eat lunch? Or oh, if I can go, well, I just need to go pay the power. Right? So, yeah, I mean, uh, they seem really firm on not doing away with the essential worker thing, but maybe... The conversation we should be having is, do these people need to be more closely monitored? Or just, you know, like, for example, if I had that in my workplace, I would I would um, make sure that they when they do come to work, that we know exactly who they are in contact with, just in mm. case that we continue to monitor. Because it's very clear that despite, you know, being vaccinated, despite uh, the PCR test, that travel increases the risk. That's that's clear. Nobody denies that. And so we just have to act like that. So we just have to know who in our workplace has been traveling and and just keep their contacts a little bit limited, you know, for that period, just so that we can track it quicker. Have you been uh, satisfied at all with the uh, level of the quality and the rate of information that has come out about these uh, these clusters? Uh, but, you know, from- I've been a, um, very vocal with public health during oversight hearing after oversight hearing with the information that they are releasing to the public. I always thought they could do more. They should do more. It took them forever to do that. But uh, recently, I'm very happy that uh, the information that they were releasing had details. It told us, you know, where these contacts were being made. It told us even businesses uh, and they told us um just kind of activity that I thought was helpful for the public to then adjust their own behavior, right? And that's, for example, perfect that they announced, you know, a certain cluster from this hotel, anyone who ate during these certain dates should get tested. That's what we have been asking for since the beginning, right? It's like, tell us where you found it so that we can get tested if we feel like we've been in contact with those. And then they, we've seen a response. So the community has responded because we have a very smart community. And that's why I always believe you give them the information, they're going to respond appropriately. And uh, so I'm appreciative of, of the information that they've been able to share. And, uh, you know, of course, when they share travel now, they're telling us exactly travel from where. Right. And that's very helpful. Mm-hmm. And I, I think so that just, if we know, I work with someone who's been traveling from this place where they have variants that have been found on Guam that we need to just be more careful or get ourselves tested or, you know, just to be sure. I think the, the um, information that a lot of people are wanting now, though, with these positives that come out is they're wanting to know were they vaccinated, were they half vaccinated, what was the status of, of the vaccination? Yes. So it took yes, so long, that- yeah, but it took so long for public health to kind of like evolve. I mean, and part of it was like they were responding to, you know, a raging fire of a pandemic here. But it took them so long to kind of evolve in disseminating the information. Do you see something like, are these COVID positives vaccinated, have vaccinated, or whatever? Do you think that's valuable information that the public? Absolutely. Of course it is. Of course it is. Because we're, you know, the public is judging, you know, whether what our leaders are telling us is true or not. And so they just want to judge for themselves, you know, and I think, so, so far what I've heard from the doctors and the governor uh, announcing in public health is that everyone who's in the hospital is, was not vaccinated. And so that was one of the claims of this vaccination was that it was going to lessen the severity of your illness, lessen hospitaliz- hospitalization. And so, it sounds, you know, just from these initial numbers to be true, or at least, you know, um, it's, uh, it's, I'm optimistic that that kind of news is going to help people to make the decision, those who are still on the fence as to whether to get vaccinated or not, that they're going to see that it's those who are not vaccinated who are still getting hospitalized, that we might all get this illness, but whether we're going to be hospitalized or die from it might, might depend on whether we were vaccinated or not. Uh, speaker, let's switch gears a little bit. There was uh, something I saw you'd put out about Agent Orange, and I know you've been like the one who's been 
leading the charge with the Agent Orange. So what was uh, that latest development? So recently, uh, um, one of the military's veterans organizations, they call it Military Veterans Organization, Inc., they filed a uh, request with the Veterans Administration that the Veterans Administration recognize a presumption that anyone who had served in Guam during these years who claimed to have Agent Orange illnesses uh, stemming from that service that they were presumed to have been exposed to Agent Orange. And this is the same presumption that is used for people who were in Vietnam. And uh, if they claim to have suffered from these certain illnesses, then they are given that presumption by the VA right now that they were exposed to Agent Orange. And so that has been expanded now through a lawsuit and uh, congressional action to you know, other places around Vietnam, uh, waters surrounding Vietnam, but it hasn't been expanded to service on Guam. Mm. And so, of course, we've been debating, uh, you know, back and forth over years. And it's not started with me. It's years before me. Many, many people came out to talk about this, especially veterans, especially residents of Guam who witnessed it, who said that, you know, herbicide had been sprayed on Guam during those same years. They believe it was Agent Orange based on, you know, their recollection of what the barrels looked like, the effects. And um, so... You know, but the D Department of Defense has outright denied that uh, they ever had Agent Orange on Guam or that they used it on Guam. Outright denied it. That's why you've seen us over the years, uh, EPA, Guam EPA, federal EPA actually joined together yeah. to do some testing mm -hmm. to see if we could prove this or not. And it's very difficult after this many years to prove it, right? Because these things degrade down, and yeah, yeah. the elements, yeah. right? So anyways, uh, this veterans organization has filed a presumption uh, with the VA, or, or a request. The VA denied it, and so they filed an appeal in the court, federal district court. And so I joined in as an amicus, uh, uh, friends of the court, uh, to also file a brief uh, in support of the veterans organization and requesting that the court, um, you know, kind of... Um, require the Veterans Administration to, to make a rule that recognizes this presumption. And attached to the briefs in this case were report after report of the contamination that has been found on Guam. You know, we've had super fun cleanups here, a couple of them. And so they had to make formal reports. We, we have reports, you know, uh, of different areas on Guam where where we find these things. And of course we have affidavits from veterans. We have affidavits from residents of Guam as to what they've witnessed and what they have experienced. And, and these illnesses are, are very, they're exactly the same illnesses right. that uh, the presumption recognizes for other places. So would you characterize this as a, I mean, is this a, a, a big move of a piece on the board for you? Well, it's great. It's um it's a big piece because, uh, Congress finally recognized, they called them blue water veterans yeah. for having been exposed. And they did that after a court case, mm. you know, also finally recognized it or forced, you know, uh, demanded that the VA also recognize a presumption for them. So this, I think, just helps to put the evidence out there. It helps to put these affidavits out there, the veterans out there. And it, you know, so it helps to urge the VA to act. And if not, I'm hoping it's going to help Congress to act as well. Because, uh, you know, we've, we've tried to tackle this on many fronts. So we do resolutions here in support of congressional actions. We've met with these congressmen who are in support of, of that recognition for Guam. And they can do that legislatively back there as well. So we're very much in support of that. I'm hoping that that's going to happen this this year, we, you know, with the new majorities back there. So we're hoping um, it's really justice for these these people who have been exposed, who suffer these severe illnesses. And, and it's tragic, you know, that it's it's years. So many of them have passed. And, and so I just want to do my part while I'm in office to, to continue this fight that actually started years ago. You know, it started um, Robert Celestial, uh, Angel Santos, you know, Ben Pangolin. Many of them have fought for years. Even Mark Forbes, you know, was a, uh, established a Blue Ribbon Panel. Tina Munya Barnes, all of them have been working to get recognition that, uh, you know, or, or it's it's not even just the compensation, but it's the health care for sure. those people who yeah. are suffering. Yeah. And it's that recognition of a disability caused by their service, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. 
that's important for them and that's justice too. Uh, let's move to a different topic. What do you expect out of the $664 million meeting with the governor next Wednesday and what are some of the big ticket priorities for the legislature? Well, I'm, I'm uh, going in there in good faith, very optimistic, uh, expecting that uh, we've got pretty much, you know, a general agreement with uh, senators here. And we want to have an agreement with the governor that, uh, you know, these are the big priorities for Guam. This is how we're going to help our people the most and the most directly. And this is how we're going to help our businesses to recover quickly. And uh, this is how we are going to act consistently with what Congress uh, intended, you know, with these funds. And so I, I, I think really it's in everyone's best interest to, to have an agreement that we can't uh, use this as an opportunity to, you know, um, I want one, this one thing. And if I don't get this one thing, you know, no deal. It, I think this is, we're going to all have to compromise a little bit, but I think it's going to be better if we can all agree because this has huge impacts, not just, you know, on the use of the money, of course, on people's lives, but it has huge impacts on, on our budget, our own government budget going forward. Right. And uh, so I think everyone has to recognize that, that these all are intertwined so inextricably that uh, they, yeah, we, it only makes sense that we are going to come to an agreement. Right, uh, Madam Speaker, but how do you characterize this? Uh, it's almost a 180 from the CARES Act where the governor was pretty much with the horse blinders, like no one can tell me how to spend this money, you can't appropriate it, to where we are now. I mean, I wouldn't call it a complete 180 because there's nothing finalized and there's we don't know. There's no indication you know, what the plan will be and how much of your request will be honored, but the fact that you guys are getting a seat at the table I mean, like I said, it's a far cry from what we saw last year. So how do you plan to really take advantage of this uh, opportunity and make you guys' mark? Well, we've been working very hard with the with the assistance of the Office of Finance and Budget here at the legislature. They've uh, uh, been able to do some analysis for us as to, you know, what we were, you know, where funding, first of all, what funding was short and what does that entail? What does that mean? Uh, what programs or services are not being provided because of that. Second of all, you know, uh, just kind of the estimates that we have gotten from agency, they have a good compilation of those as to if we are going to, you know, impact this, you know, how much does that cost? So things like that. We are, of course, hoping um, uh, to get, for example, the RISE Act, that's direct payments to people. Right, and of course, that was a unanimous decision by the former legislature that just in, you know last year that uh, we see this as the greatest need that people who are in categories of income you know less than that amount that they are going to get some assistance and um, that they can spend however they need to spend because we recognize you know rent, right. utilities, yeah. just cost of living, everything is um, you know really impacted them. So that's number one. And as you remember, yeah, the price started off at 400. We doubled it. I doubled it uh, by my amendment to 800 at the time. And uh, so, of course, we still stand by that. And we expect that the governor is going to implement that. And from whatever funding source, and we gave her that uh, flexibility to use whatever funding source. But these funds, uh, for sure, if it hasn't been done by then, then by all means, it should be these funds should be used for Man, that. Speaker, I know this this RISE Act is a real big talking point with the Republicans, uh, and I mean, and you as well. But I got to say, the need is real. Like, I don't know where the governor is. And, and I think the issue she has was that the GovGuam employees aren't getting any of the RISE Act or something. And so she was yeah. talking about, oh, it's not fair or whatever. But when I go around, Madam Speaker, People are always asking me to ask about the RISE Act. Just yesterday, I was picking up lunch at Chamorro Village. This guy was like, hey, can you ask what, what's up with the RISE Act? So, I mean, it's real. Yeah, people are kind of like expecting because it was a law, right? Yeah. Well, when you say the need is real, I, I absolutely agree with you 100%, 300%. I agree with that. Then the need is real, and it's so evident. And um, unfortunately, you know, we say uh, businesses are opening, uh, people are getting back to work, some of them, but uh, 
they are still, it's just, it's been so long that the impacts just compile on top of each other yeah. and they, they're getting to be complex now. Right. Uh, and so that's why we recognize just recently in a bill that was passed for uh, the BPT bond to refinance it. We asked that some of the proceeds of that saving or some of the savings from that uh, refinancing of the business privilege tax that that go immediately to to food assistance because we continue to see the long lines. The mayors make it very clear that um, the people in their villages are in need. I don't know of any mayor who thinks otherwise. And I still, the limited times that I actually go out and meet people in public because those are still limited right now, yeah, that yeah. that's, they're always bringing that to my attention, that they, yeah. they still are in need. They're critical of, you know, can yeah. we get more assistance? Can we get it faster? And, and yeah. things like that. So, yeah, I don't. I, I not, absolutely agree that the need is there. I'm just not comfortable, Madam Speaker, with us having to like explain. The, I mean, because at the end of the day, it's a law. I mean, it it just reminds me of that ten million dollars that was supposed to go to the Guam Memorial Hospital. Um, yes. I mean, they're laws that the administration is just choosing to ignore, and that's to me. It's I'm just not comfortable with that example, and I don't like how we have to sit here and say like, "Oh, the people really need it. The people really need it." Like it's a law. At the end of the day. To pay it out so well now there are two laws right, right. saying uh pay pay some assistance out and and they've honored some of the other laws yeah. so yeah. it is uh it is you know perplexing but i hope that is not going to be the case moving forward because i'm telling you this is uh if we're going to sit here and quabble about money you know for the next two years how we spend this money and we can't come to an agreement, then I just think that's a that's a loss for everyone. Because even while we're paying it out, people will not feel satisfied that we've done our best. They're going to, you know, be critical the entire way. Yeah. And I don't I just feel like if we're gonna rebuild Guam, let's rebuild, let's let's grow, let's um, move forward and give everyone the confidence that we are doing our best, they are part of it, you know, that the sacrifices that they are making are part of, you know. Just helping all of us and uh, that no one's sacrificing alone and no one's sacrificing only, you know, while yeah, the others yeah, benefit. And yeah. that, that's one thing I really don't want to see is that, the, you know, we pick and choose who's going to benefit uh, and and not necessarily get those who are most need. Madam Speaker, thank you for your time. I got to run them at the top of the hour, but we definitely appreciate uh, your time here on the link and have a great day. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Esther, 750.